And so we're going to continue in a series that we've been on over the last several weeks. It's a series that we've entitled, I'm All Right. And the purpose of this series is really to kind of bring us to the practical side of how this gospel works in our lives, the power of it in our lives, what it does for our lives, how do we apply it. And so the series that we've been on has been taking us into a study in the book of Romans. And this book of Romans is important because like the early church that was situated in Rome, it still has power today as it begins to clarify for us what it means to be saved, what it means to be a child of God, what it means to be righteous, and how do we practically apply that? Amen? Amen. How many of you know it's no good just to know some spiritual concepts but not know how to apply it in our daily lives? And so the book of Romans is one of the best uh, uh, ways that the, that the scriptures lay out for us how we do this. And so uh, it's for that reason that today I want to encourage you to dig into God's Word with me. I want to encourage you to lean in and open the, the ears, the eyes, the hearing, the receptors in your heart and in your mind as we dig into Romans chapter 6 and 7 and heed to God's Word and talk on the topic, breaking free. Breaking free. Now let me ask you a question. You ever been stuck in an area of your life? You ever been stuck? We all have. Some of us, we're stuck in areas of our lives now. We're stuck in hurts, we're stuck in loss, we're stuck in circumstances, we're stuck in challenges, we're stuck in the past. And the reason why we usually get stuck is because there's a hold in an area of our lives. And the book of Romans really does speak to this area, this challenge, and it teaches us how to break free. It really does. One of the most difficult things that any follower of Christ any person who's seeking God, any person who's wanting anything from God, one of the most difficult things that we face is breaking free from that which we once knew so that we can embrace and accept what God has before us, right? And the truth is that some of us, we have not broken free from our past. We have not broken free from what we know, what we've been conditioned to. We have not broken free from what we've learned. Understand this, in order to, to learn anything new, it requires you replacing that which, which, you, which you knew, which is old. And here's the sad reality that for many people today, when it comes to acknowledging God, understanding God, uh, uh, receiving anything from God's word, even receiving anything from what someone might share, such as myself or others, the truth is that we let what we've known get in the way of what God is trying to introduce to us. And today I want you to simply do this with me. I want you to come with an open heart and an open mind and consider the truth that God's word introduces to us. If you find yourself stuck in any area of your life, or when you do find yourself stuck, because it will happen, we must consider the scriptures and look to the freedom that the word of God proposes to us and so it's for that reason that I want us to turn to Romans chapter 6. We're going to go to Romans chapter 6, and we're going to start at verses 1 and 2. And then we're going to skip over to verse 5 and read on. Starting at verse 1 in Romans chapter 6, it says, What shall we say then? What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So let me just pause right there and give you uh, some background on what's going on here. From the onset of Romans chapter 6, Paul is uh, addressing an issue that was taking place in the early church in Rome and still takes place today. And it's this. Once you begin to understand how great the forgiveness is that God has extended to us in Christ... Once you understand that God has dealt with the issue of sin and that sin does not have power in our lives, something begins to happen. For some of us, for many of us, myself included, I've been there, we begin to think, well, if God's grace covers me, if God's forgiveness is complete for me, then anything that I do wrong is okay. And what Paul begins to say here is this, listen, 
having lived according to a mindset, a belief system, a life that was sinful, he says, just because you have grace, does that mean that you should continue in it? And he says, no. He says, no. How can we do that when we died to it? And so here's what he's saying. The past that you once knew, the mindsets that once dominated you, the beliefs that you once had in your heart, by Christ, God has given you a new way of life, and that life that you once had is now dead. So he says, we can't continue there. Now, I want you to begin to think about this, because this is going to tie in to wh where we're leading into. And so let's jump to verse 5, and then we're going to circle back around and dig into this some more. He goes on to say in verse 5, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Think of it this way. What's true of Jesus is true of you. So just like he died and put sin to death, you died and sin is dead to you. Right? And just like he rose, the scripture says you rose. Verse 6, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that, the, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. Verse 7, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. He's not talking about a physical death. He's talking about you have become alive in Christ. And so that memory, that belief system, that way has died. The problem is for some of us, too many of us, we're still trying to resurrect it. So anyway, he goes on to say, verse 9, For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. He's talking about the the outcome of sin and how it brings decay in our lives. Verse 10, he says, The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Now listen closely to this. In the same way, in the same way, he's leading us into something. He says, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ." Jesus. Here's what he's saying. You must accept. You must believe. You must come to the place of understanding where you get this. That part of me is dead. Now I know that for many of us, this, this, is, this conflicts with our belief system. This conflicts with the way we see things. But I, but I guarantee you that if you will listen to the scriptures today and you consider the truth that God gives us by his word, you don't have to live stuck and you won't. You won't. But see, it's a choice. Right? So he goes on to say in verse 12, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law. You are under grace. So listen, I get it. Many of us are excited about this. We, we clap. You know, it's, it's awesome. I'm there with you. But let me ask you a question. Why then is it so hard to break free from old ways? Why is it so hard to remain stuck in that thing that plagues your heart? Why is it that while being children of God, believing in Jesus, believing that he paid the price for sin, believing that we're righteous, why is it that we still default to all ways of thinking, all ways of doing, all ways of acting, right? All ways of speaking, old mannerisms, old habits, things that are destructive to us. 
Why is it that we go back to the choices that we know we shouldn't make that contradict the instruction in God's word, but we still do it? And listen, in Romans chapter 6, it all comes down, here's what it reveals. It all comes down to faulty beliefs. Things that don't work. Now, I'm going to tell you why that's such a powerful statement. Because oftentimes we focus on changing what we do. We're focused on if I could just change my actions, if I could just change the people around me, if I could just change the circumstances, if I could just change my location. Let me tell you something. You can change all that, but your beliefs still go with you. And if those beliefs are based on wrong information, if they are not based on the truth in God's word, then here's what will happen. You will go wherever you want to go, but you will be stuck wherever you go. And there is freedom. You can break free. You know, for many years... I struggled with what the scriptures are saying here. I struggled because I believed in Jesus. But I came to realize years later that I believed backwards. I believed backwards. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I accepted Christ and I believed that he was with me. I believed that I now lived with him. But I struggled with what Romans 8. Uh, Romans 6 says, let me, let me point your attention to verse 8. Verse 8 says, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Let me tell you what I mean. Let's leave that verse up. Let me tell you what I mean by believing backwards. I believed that I was Jesus, but I didn't believe that that old part of me had died. It's belief backwards. I believed that everything that I had come to know, everything that I had experienced, that it still defined me as a person, that it was my identity. I believed that my addictions were my identity. I believed that my hurts were my identity. I believed that my hangups were my identity. I believed that everything that I had been taught that told me I was stupid, that told me that I couldn't, that told me that I was incapable, that told me that I wasn't worthy, that told me that I couldn't be anything good in life. I believed those things, but I believed in Jesus. And the problem with that is this, that where those beliefs attempt to coexist with the truth in God's word, God's word cannot work because you are still holding to beliefs, to beliefs that keep you bound. So here's a question for you. What do you believe that pulls you down? Is it I can't? Is it I'm not good enough? Is it I'm damaged goods? Is it that I'm enslaved to habits? Is it that I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm this hurt person? Is that it? Because what I am proposing to you this morning to consider is this, that you are holding to beliefs that are contradicting the very thing, the very one that you say you believe in. And while you believe in him and he loves you and he's there for you, you're trying to exist in two worlds and that tension is tearing you apart. I want you to see, let's put up verse 6. I want us to see something in verse 6. Notice what he says. He says, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should be no longer slaves to sin. Listen to what the scripture is revealing. The old you was put to death when you accepted Christ. There was a change 
in you. I know what some of you just thought. Well, how come I don't feel it? See, that's the problem. You base life on feelings. You base life on what you see. You're of the opinion, if I can't see it, I can't believe it. Well, guess what? You can't receive anything from God. Because you're not operating by faith. You're operating by flesh, by what you see, by what you feel. Listen, if you go by your feelings, you will never grow up. You will never be free. You won't. Because feelings fluctuate. Circumstances change. People come and go. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing a mouthful with you here. So look at verses 8 and 9. Oh, matter of fact, I'll just go back to verse 6. I'm sorry. I want you to notice what it says. For we know. We know that our old self has been crucified. And that's not talking about knowing knowledge. That's talking about being intimately acquainted in relationship, close and up, uh, up close and personal, tied to join. The Apostle Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says here, for we are intimate and know this by relationship to be true, that who we were is no longer who we are now. I'm dead to that. And it's dead to me. Let me ask you a question. Do you know who you are in Christ that way? See, herein is the key to being free. And so, Romans 6 brings to light an important truth that we must all come to grips with. And it's this, it's that to break free, we must break away from that which once broke us. I'm going to say that again. To break free, we must break away from that which once broke us. Let me tell you what I'm talking about here. The belief that keeps you stuck in that habit. The belief that keeps you stuck in that anger. The belief that keeps you stuck in that place where you are afraid to break out and try something that you've never tried before. The belief that keeps you stuck in that place where you don't believe that you can prosper, that you can grow, that you can be strong. That belief, is it building you or breaking you. And here's my point with this, in light of this, this, this statement that I made. That to break free, you must break away from that belief that's breaking you. There is no if, ands, or buts to this, ladies and gentlemen. Man, it my, my heart breaks when I talk to people, man, and they say, yeah, you know, I believe in Jesus, but, 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 I'm, you know, I'm still, but, you know, I got this issue, but, this is my background, but, this is what's going on, but, this is, this is what people do, but, you got your butt in the wrong place. Time to break free. You know, the Bible provides us an example of this through the life of a woman in Genesis 19 who made a tragic choice. It was a choice that she had to break free, but she didn't. And I, I don't, we, we're not going to read it. I'll just read one verse from it in a second. But the way the, the, way the, the account goes, uh, God looked upon a place called Sodom. It was one of two cities. The other one was Gomorrah. And these were very wicked cities. So much so that God chose to extend mercy to it. Now, I know what some of you are thinking because you're Bible scholars. Mercy? 
Didn't God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Yes. But let me tell you why I say he extended mercy to them. I want you to think of it this way. If your hand is rotten and decaying, right? If it is putrid, it stinks, the skin is dead, the muscles don't work, and it's spreading. Let me tell you what mercy is. I will sacrifice this hand so that the rest of the body can remain healthy. And so God saw the wickedness in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he said, I have to destroy this place. Now, mind you, we're not there today. Because of Jesus, God does not uh, treat men this way. He does not relate to us this way. He does not address our shortcomings this way any longer. The scripture says that Jesus took the wrath of God upon himself. All that punishment was upon him. That's why God's not dealing with this world today the way he did then. But anyway, so God destroys Sodom. But before he destroys Sodom, he answers the prayer of a guy named Abraham who said, God, if there's at least just one person who's righteous, would you spare this city? God says, I won't, but I'll spare the righteous. And so he sends these angels out to, to, to Sodom, and they come to the house of uh, Lot, who is Abraham's nephew. Long story short, when they show up there, they say, quick, get your, get, get your wife, get your children, get your household, and leave. This place is about to be destroyed. And so the Bible says that Lot hesitated. And the angels said, oh, no, 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 no. So they grabbed him and his family and got them out of there. Right? Eventually, uh, and one of the things that they told Lot and his family was, once you get out of here, don't look back. And so now they end up in this small town called Zoar. And when they're in Zoar, here's what happens. Uh, now, mind you, Zoar is a place of deliverance. They've gotten out of the zone of destruction. They're free, right? And all of a sudden, the scripture says that sulfur, burning sulfur, begins to rain down upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's all being destroyed. And the scripture says that Lot's wife looked back at Sodom. And immediately she became a pillar of salt. It was a destructive result. Now, here's the thing. What's wrong with taking a look back? What's wrong with it? What's wrong with looking backwards and going, man, I remember that. The thing about it is that when the scripture talks about looking back, it's not referring to the physical act of looking. The Hebrew word for look back there is the Hebrew word nabat. And what that word means is to look upon with regard. It means to look upon with respect and favor. It speaks of longing for it. <laughs> Excuse me. And so what we see is this. It's that Lot's wife... She wanted her life in Sodom. She longed for it with great desire. She, she longed for the, the days, the moments. She longed for the wickedness. She longed for the lifestyle. She longed for the belief, the way of life there. You know, the unfortunate truth is this, that she had left Sodom, but Sodom had not left her. You know, many people today find themselves in this same predicament. We assent that God has put something good before us. I'm not there where I used to be. So we assent, yes, God has been good to me. God has blessed me. God has helped me. But we still believe that there is something to be enjoyed from what's behind us. And this leads us to our first point of practical application from God's word. Listen, if God says it's behind you, it's because there truly is something better ahead of you. 
Let me say that again. If God says it's behind you, it's because there truly is something better ahead of you. You know, like Lot's wife. And even in the church that was in Rome that Paul is writing this to by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. These were people that were stuck. They were stuck in what they knew. They were stuck in old belief systems in old ways. And because they were stuck there while they were trying, attempting to follow Christ, while they were seeking to understand God, they did not see how much better it was before them. They were more convinced that what was behind them was still good. Let me propose something to you on a very practical level, very simple. But it's so important to think about this. Why are you here today? Why are you interested in what the scriptures have to say? Why are you choosing to even make room for God to be able to speak into your life? Let me tell you why. Because we all know the answer to this, but few of us think about it. Because I want something more than what I've had. I want something better than what I've known. Which speaks to a greater truth, a deep truth. We all acknowledge that what we've believed does not work for us. Now, too many of us do not think critically to this level. We think on the surface. So let me, let me go there. Are the results you're getting working for you? Are you truly any better? Are you truly growing? Are you truly experiencing freedom? If you are not, my friend, don't beat yourself up. But acknowledge this. Your actions, your results are speaking to the truth that you are believing lies. Thus, you're stuck. And I want you to see that God wants you to be free. 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 You know, like Lot's wife, we're all subject to look behind us and to relive the memories of old. To be there. Listen, some of us, we think about our past and we're not just thinking about it. We are there. You identify with the feelings. You identify with the environment. You identify with, with what's going on. And the thing about it is that when you're looking behind, you get so caught up in the feeling and the emotion and the desire that you forget the pain and the loss that you've suffered in that place. See, when it comes to the life that you lived apart from Christ, when it comes to those beliefs that have kept you stuck and the lifestyle that resulted from it, the things that were happening in your life because of it, you and I would be wise to view the past like we do when we look through a rearview mirror. Let me tell you what I mean by that. If you think about when you're driving, the rearview mirror has one purpose. Yes, it's to look back, but you only look back for reference so that you can know is there any danger behind you that you need to avoid? Here's the thing about the rear view. It's for a glance. You try driving. Now, here's where, where too many people go wrong. We drive like we're looking through the rear view mirror. No wonder we crash in life so much. We should instead approach life with the view as one who's looking through the windshield. Because the windshield gives you a wider view. It gives you context for where you're going, not where you've been. It shows you that there's more ahead. 
And what I want you to consider is this, that you might take a glance backwards, but you cannot afford to live as if you're viewing life backwards. You're bound to crash. So why is it that some of us are still looking backwards with regard and longing? Why is it that some of us are still crashing through life? And I submit to you that it's because we still believe that there is life to be found back there. There's still something worth resurrecting. So listen to Romans 7 in this regard. We're going to read starting at verse 1. It says, brothers and sisters, you all understand the law of Moses. Follow the train of thought here. So surely you know that the law rules over people only while they are alive. It's like what the law says about marriage. So Paul is appealing to Jewish people here and non-Jewish people who have an understanding of how the Mosaic laws work. And he's saying, think about the law. Consider how the law works. You have to follow it. And then he says, let's take for example the laws, what the law says pertaining to marriage. He says, a woman must stay married to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is made free from the law of marriage. But if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, the law says she is guilty of adultery. But if her husband dies, she is made free from the law of marriage. So if she marries another man after her husband dies, she is not guilty of adultery. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, your old selves died. And you became free from the law through the body of Christ. Now you belong to someone else. You belong to the one who was raised from death. We belong to Christ so that we can be used in service to God. So let me, let me break this down for you and make it real simple and practical. As lo- according to the Mosaic law, the Old Testament law, as long and, and even to this day, this is good advice. But as long as a woman was married to her husband while he's alive, the law said you are duty-bound to your husband. It said you cannot, you should not, you must not attempt to be in relationship with another man. And according to the Mosaic law, if you broke that law, then you were sentenced to death. You were stoned. That's what the law said. So here's what Paul is saying. He's saying just like the law that, kept, that keeps you bound to a husband, there was a law at work in your life before you came to know Christ. And this law kept you bound to your old way of living. It kept you bound to, your for, your, to false beliefs. It kept you bound to your destructive outcomes, your habits, your hang-ups, your hurts. He says, but now, in the same way, you have died. That, that, that relationship you had died. And he says, you are now married to another. Listen to what he's saying. You are free from an obligation from the belief that says you're still a sinner. That's the root. Let me translate that for you. There is nothing wrong with you. Somebody really needs to hear that because you are living out of that belief so well and it's so bad there is nothing wrong with you nothing wrong with you now for you here's what you're doing right now you're looking at your outcomes you're looking at your behaviors 
and you're saying, oh, no, everything's wrong with me. My friend, you are living out of that belief. No wonder you're stuck. No wonder. But you see, because of Christ, the scripture reveals the issue, sin. It died in you. And you're now free from it. And you're united to Christ. You know where we're going wrong? For some of us, we are new, all of us here that know Christ as Lord, you are a new creation. But you're still clinging to a relationship that is destructive. Let me put it to you this way. It's spiritual adultery. You belong to Christ, but you're still holding on to another. The truth is that you are no longer bound to what is behind you. God has a new and better life ahead of you. Believe it and step into it from this day forward. Listen closely. There is nothing wrong with you. Nothing. Let that belief work in your heart. Let that truth begin to work in your heart. The second thing I want to leave you with here is that what you believe is a result of who you feed. What you believe is a result of who you feed. What are you talking about, Pastor Jose? Think about this. Lot's wife was now living in a place of freedom far from Sodom. She wasn't in Sodom anymore. She was free from the destruction zone. But she still had a strong desire for Sodom and the beliefs that derived from it. And we have to explore why that was. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever asked yourself or told yourself this? Why do I keep doing the things that I don't want to do but I keep doing anyway? Why why do I do that? Listen to what Paul says in Romans 7. Starting at verse 18, he says, yes, I know that nothing good lives in me. Sounds like it's contradicting what we're actually seeing in the scriptures. Just hang tight. He says, I mean nothing good lives in the part of me that is not spiritual. I want to do what is good, but I don't do it. I don't do the good that I want to do. I do the evil that I don't want to do. So if I do what I don't want to do, then I'm not really the one doing it. Sounds confusing. Hang tight. We're going we're gonna to unpack this. It is the sin living in me that does it. Wait, but I thought you just said we're not sinners. Hang tight. Follow the, follow the train of thought here according to what God is revealing. He says, so I have learned this rule. When I want to do good, evil is there with me. The opportunity is there. In my mind, I am happy with God's law. But I see another law working in my body. Keep this phrase in mind. I see another law working in my body. It's not sin. It's the law working in the body. Remember that. We're going to unpack that in a second. He says, that law makes war against the law that my mind accepts. That other law working in my body is the law of sin. And that law makes me its prisoner. He says, what a miserable person I am. Who will save me from this body that brings me death? I thank God for his salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it almost sounds like Paul is kind of creating a loophole. And he's saying, man, this is my excuse for why I keep doing what I do. But that's not what he's saying at all here. No, Paul actually identifies why this happens for us, why we get stuck. Let me read to you verse 18 first. He says, I know that nothing good lives in me. But then he identifies what he actually means. He says, I mean nothing good lives in the part of me that is not spiritual. He's talking about this body. Now watch what he says in verse 23. 
he says, I see another law working in my body. And that law makes war against the law that my mind accepts. So let me just unpack this for you. You know, accepting Jesus as Lord does not immediately change your appetites. Let me tell you what I mean by that. If you struggled with alcohol yesterday and you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, let me be very clear. You will still have that desire for alcohol. Why? Because that desire functions like a law. Let me tell you what I mean by that. In Germany, there's a long stretch of road called the Autobahn. And there are certain parts of the Autobahn where you don't have a speed limit. And so I was reading an article a while back, quite a while back, and in the article, there was this gentleman who was in the driver's seat of a Ferrari that belonged to the man who was sitting next to him. And he's on the Autobahn, and his friend who's in the passenger seat who owns the Ferrari says to him, Go ahead and go as fast as you want. And this guy, he goes 60, he goes 65, he goes 70, he goes 75, and he begins to feel like this ain't right. And so he's driving and the, the, the owner of the Ferrari says to him, no, go faster. And he goes, I can't. He says, yes, you can. He says, but what about the speed limit? He says, there is no speed limit. In his mind, he's conditioned to the fact that, you know what, I have to stick to 65, 70, 75. This guy's saying, push it to 140, push it to 150, go to 160, go to 180, see how fast you can go. Try it. But he's limited by his understanding of a law. Here's what the scripture's saying. You got to really dig into this. And I want to encourage you when this gets reposted tomorrow, go back and listen to this. Go back and study this for yourself. Don't take my word for it. What Paul is saying is this. Sin operates like a law. You once lived under it. You functioned according to it. You believed according to it. You acted according to it. And so Paul says... All these things that I do that I don't want to do occur for one reason. Because I still remember what life was like under that system. You know why we do things that are sinful? It's not because we're sinners. It's because we're still familiar with the laws that dictated life apart from Christ. You got to chew on that. Man, I am giving you some meat today. But you got to dig into this. Like this man in this article that I was reading, we've become so accustomed to the laws that, that dictated our lives as sinners that we attempt to incorporate them into our new life in righteousness. And what we find is that we're restricted, it leads to frustration. Paul says this, he expresses that frustration. He says, miserable person that I am, who will save me from this body? And then he says this, he gives us the answer. Thank God for his salvation in Christ Jesus. Here's what he's saying, because I don't have time to really dig into this. I really want to, but I don't have time. If you study that word salvation there, it's not simply referring to the point where you are forgiven of your sin. It's not just about forgiveness of sin. That word salvation is the Greek word sozo. That word sozo speaks about peace. It speaks about joy. It speaks about healing. It refers to prosperity. It speaks to a good, uh, God's benevolence towards you, God's favor. It's talking about a quality of life. Yes. And what I want you to see is this, that what saves us from the former life is when we step in and function according to the promises in this new life. Listen, if you want to remain stuck, just stay in your former belief system. Just stay there. But if you want to step into something completely different and see the power of God at work in your life, here's what Paul says. Thank God 
for my salvation, for the work of God that is still working in me. You know how that begins to work? You begin to feed your mind, your heart, your life, your understanding according to who you are in Christ. And you begin to shut off everything that tells you you're still who that person was. You're still stuck there. You're still a drunk. You're still an addict. You're still broken. You're still hurt. You're still damaged goods. You cut all that off. Here's the point. When you starve the past, guess what happens? The future is emboldened. You grow. Man, I'm way over time. Let's stand here. I want to leave you with one closing thought. Colossians 2, 13 through 15 says this. You were spiritually dead because of your sins. And because you were not free from the power of your sinful self. But God gave you a new life together with Christ. He forgave all our sins. Because we broke God's laws, we owed a debt. A debt that listed all the rules we failed to follow. Listen closely. But God forgave us that debt. Your new life is paid for. And your sinful old nature, according to what God says, no longer exists. Here's the key, though. As long as you believe you owe something for it, you're still living with the belief that you are in debt and you are tied to your sin. But the moment you believe that what Jesus did canceled that debt, here's what you begin to realize. I don't owe my past anything. I don't owe you time. I don't owe you energy. I don't owe you belief. I don't own you relationship. I don't own you any habit. I don't own you any attention. I am free. And when you understand that you are free, not by what you can do for God, but by what he did for you, my friend. You can break free. I leave you with this thought. You have a new life, but it's so that you can live it. Let me say that again. You have a new life in Christ so that you can live it. I'm going to tell you why I end with that. Because here's the power. Live it. Choose to live it. Make the choice that I'm moving on. That I'm moving forward. That I'm breaking free from the hold of everything that told me that I'm stuck. That I am accepting that what God has done is better. That I'm no longer living in Sodom in my heart and in my mind, Amen. I'm free. That's why the scripture says this, and you shall know the truth. You shall know the truth. And that truth, it will make you free. You feel stuck? The issue is what you don't know. What you don't know. And today I'm giving you something that is essential for you to know so you can be free. Anybody interested in some freedom? Anybody interested in breaking free? Father, today we come to you in the precious and mighty name of Jesus and we are confronted with this truth that you have given everything and made the way for us to live free of sin. To live free from our past. To live free from every belief that tears us down. And that freedom comes by understanding and knowing the reality that what you did in Jesus not only forgave our sin, but it made us brand new. Today, Holy Spirit, I pray 
that you would do what the word says, that you would teach us and that you would open our eyes to see that which is to come. And right now in this place, all over this place in our line, eyes are being opened, minds are being renewed, lives are being transformed because you are coming to the place where you believe, you believe, you believe, and you accept that your Sodom is behind you, that your past is dead. You believe and you understand and you accept I'm not dragging any dead weight any longer. And so be free and walk in all the good and the new that God has for you. Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us here at Church of the Bridge today. I pray that you had a personal encounter with God, that he spoke to you powerfully, and that he met you at your place of need with this message. I also want to encourage you to go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube page. By doing so, you'll be able to check out past messages, uh, past events that we've done. You'll also be able to see what's happening now and those things that are to come. And lastly, I'd like to invite you to join with us in all that God is doing with your giving. Feel free to do so on our website. Again, thank you again for joining us, and I can't wait to connect with you next week.